Zach Evnesh here with the Iron Roots Podcast brought to you by Play. Friends, folks, fellow meatheads, we're 15 feet away from the highway as we stand in front of the famous York Barbell Hall of Fame Museum. During these next few episodes, we are going to be taking you down the ultimate trip through memory lane of iron history, talking to you about the greats from the 70s, 60s, all the way down to the 30s. And remember, if you're listening, you're only catching half of this podcast. You got to see what we're going to be showing by video. We're taking you inside the Hall of Fame Museum, photos that have not been shared before. So make sure you watch it at plae.pro, play.pro. I'm pumped up for this, guys, so get your old school weight gain shake ready. Whole milk, ice cream, banana, honey, peanut butter, and anything else that'll make you get jacked. We'll see you guys inside play.pro. This is Play's Iron Roots, a podcast dedicated to uncovering the strength legends, the training methods, and the stories around physical culture and iron history. I'm your host, Zach Evanesh. Grab yourself a protein shake, chalk up, and prepare to travel back in time to some of the most awe-inspiring stories of iron history. It's go time. On this episode of the Iron Roots podcast, Zach continues his conversation with Jan Dellinger at the York Barbell Museum. What was like some of the, um, for, for you and your experiences, like the best supplement? They had like crash weight gain, liver tablets was big, all this stuff. And there was such a mystique behind everything that I wonder how some of it must have been psychological. You felt like, I'm drinking this shake. I'm just going to get so yeah. strong now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you one product we had was protein from the sea. <laughs> which was wicked stuff but like tasting bad bad tasting well, that, and and if you were anywhere if, if you happen to be anywhere near a bathroom where somebody was excreting <laughs> that stuff i mean it was it was horrible i mean this is before my time but lifters told me say oh god it's, it's, and was it a good seller did people buy it oh yeah and for a while and then he took it off the market people, <laughs> it, it had a relatively short cycle of sales because of this. It was horrible tasting. Right. It was great protein. I mean, as far as just protein content, it was great. Right. But it was whew, stuff, you know, you, even if you mixed it with like ice cream. And I was just gonna say the the um, the weight gain shakes back then when they would like look, when I looked through the magazines, it was always milk, banana, peanut butter, ice cream, calories. honey, calories. Yeah. And there, I can't remember the article, but it, it um, it may have been like uh, one of the keys to progress yeah, articles. Yeah, yeah. Had a game for him, a game yes, and you know what's really interesting is I'd say in like the past, I mean, it actually started when I first started. The, one of the first kids I trained, he was a wrestler. He had to be held back a grade because the lightest wrestling weight class was 103. He weighed like 83. And I still remember like having that bodybuilding knowledge and reading the old magazines. I still get a lot of these kids that they're going to enter high school, right. they're going to wrestle at this 103 pound weight class, now it's 106, but they're 20 pounds undersized. I go back and I say, I'm going to, I'm going to share with your parents this old weight gain shake. I go, your dad probably read about it and it's, and it's like you're going to have milk ice cream, honey, dried oats in there, banana, peanut butter. And I said, you know what that shake is called? It's called living the dream because you can't do that when you get older. Right, right, but that stuff right. is what is great for the guys that can't gain weight. Right. But like you said, if you go back into the, well, okay, the Weeder magazines, a lot of the York, early York magazine, it was people gain weight oriented. Milo was like, yeah. once in a great while, I, there was at least five of those kinds of articles to every one of them. You know, hey, you're fat, you know, that's... Yeah. yeah, and then any of the toning articles seemed to be, like, for the women, specifically yeah. for the women. Yeah. Everything else was based around gain muscle, gain, get yeah. strong, yeah. and build confidence. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I ha keep all of these magazines with hopes that, like, when my son gets older, that he'll just find his way into the office and, like, fall asleep on the floor reading all that stuff, because... Yeah. I, I grew up reading Flex Magazine, and you yeah. mentioned that like Bob, 
you know, the people eventually learned, like, Bob's not writing these articles. And I remember reading yeah. Flex. But, but, but Bob wrote, wrote everything uh, up to, I'll say, 19, into the 1960s. And then who, who wrote the articles from there? Was it John? Was it you? Was it well, I, interviewing I, others? Cameron, I'm sure, it had the same job. Uh, maybe Gord, Ven Gord Venables was a, a good, very good lifter, athletic guy, all-around athletic guy. Yep. Um, who died in 1974. Okay. I'm sure he did a lot of that stuff. Gord was a very good uh, draftsman, artist, pen and ink artist, and is had he well-read. Was he the one that, when we look at the ads, m many of the ads are like a sketch of like somebody, be, they're just beautiful. I, I always say like, there's one ad that says like, pack your muscles full of dynamite and it's a guy doing like a yeah, the, 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 the dynamite coming out of the art yeah is that very possibly that? very possible the drawings are just me i mean they pull you right in i i think i figured this out if, and i don't <laughs> care if it's york i don't care if it's weeder sure they're any of these guys go back to leaderman and mail over course they had some very talented all-around guy uh, right. That that could could write. That that could draw. That that could do, maybe even like do draft drafting, uh, design equipment and things like yes. that. Uh, various kinds of artwork, painting. Gord was that guy here. Uh, a guy like E. M. Orlick would have been Weeder's guy for a while. Um, I don't know to what extent. Jowett had that aura about him as far as a writer, but I don't. I'm, I'm sure. Milo had somebody on staff that did that stuff. Sure. Uh, but, but a lot of, yeah, and, and there's some other guys that sort of freelance, they would send some to York, send some to Iron Man, things like that. Yeah. But, but you often had to have somebody, oh, well, Charlie Smith would have been another. I don't know about his artistic ability, but his writing ability, because Weeder had boxing and wrestling magazines. He had several kinds of magazines. Uh, we had boxing and wrestling magazines that in the early 1950s that Smith was involved with. Uh, bodybuilding magazines. Yeah, there's about two years worth. And sometimes you can, I think it was called Boxing and Wrestling. Uh, you can, then I think Stan Weston brought them out. Uh, but yeah, they're, 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 uh, they're, they're, they're uh, collectible, very collectible. And you can find them on like uh, eBay. E eBay, sure, yeah, eBay. Yeah. What's been interesting with how I've gotten the majority of my uh, muscular development and strength and health magazines is people gifted gave them to me they were guys that had read them when they were kids and in their young adulthood but they knew i would really yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, somebody mailed me a box from chicago and um, then another guy um, gave me like a shopping bag of uh, some some friends of ours like dr ken vhs tapes um, the original dino files from brooks cubic oh, yeah. And then, of course, you know, Strength and Health magazines. So uh, they they gifted them to me, and I always say, like, this stuff finds me. And um, yep. you know, we we're talking about equipment earlier, Jan, like the different plates, and um, <clears throat> some of my early, actually, like the first YMCA I trained at had all York dumbbells, yeah. York plates. It had the York isometric rack. So I, I want to talk about the equipment that York was building. I'm not sure when that started, but even to this day, if you go on Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, you know, two weeks ago, I picked up York bumpers that might be before I was born. Yeah. You know, people are still trying to buy the older, like that York equipment is older than I am or right about my age. That's like four decades worth. I mean, it's yeah. not, it hasn't broke. It's still like be, the well, best stuff out there. That was, if you looked at the <clears throat> best commercial grade stuff, the bars, the plates, uh, one or two of the, the benches, things like that, um, they did offer really stout prize. Well, again, the, the, it was Olymp it, for Olympic, the bars and plates for Olympic lifting. You know, they had to meet certain specs, so they just, because they used them in, in the international competition. Right. They just had to meet certain specs. Uh, I also know when I, back in the days when I would travel around here and there, one place I remember we went was in Quantico at the FBI headquarters. Yeah, I've been there. And they had um, bars that, that had been there and used by every <coughs> Tom, Dick, and Harry under the sun. The knurling was almost, it almost had to be re -nurled. But the bars were fine, they still worked, uh, the plates were good, and they, you know, they, you, you're not going to get imported bars and plates 
the ha stand up like that. Yes, you have to pay more for that, but if you're going to have a sustained, ongoing establishment like a YMCA, like a, a training facility installation like that, serious people training, you want stuff that you don't have to keep buying it. Think about this, the bumpers I have that I picked up, you said they might be from 74, 75. Yeah, that means 40, you know, that's 43 years yeah. old and they're still, I, now I've got them. I've got- um, And you showed me the pictures, they were used. Oh they, yeah. They, these are like original paint. Oh yeah, they've been used. I've got York dumbbells yeah. and uh, I had a friend that would, had a company that would go and basically clean out gyms that were going out of business or if it was like a pro team or a university, when they'd get a new staff, they'd yeah, get rid of the equipment. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so he gave me um, 60s up to 100s of the York, not the globe dumbbells, but they were called, that's the round heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how old are those round heads about, do you know? Three decades? Uh, Seven, if, if you're talking about the bun style round buns, heads. Buns, yep. Oh no, they're not, I know, they're not the buns, they're almost like, they're the round heads, but I know the buns are kind of shaped like hamburger buns. Yeah, or something like yeah that. these are more almost like not a square, but they're almost squared off. Uh, Easily trying to years, think, right? Easily. Yeah, 25 years, yeah. Yeah, think about that. So I always look at stuff, I go, okay, if this thing costed me $500, you know, looking back, it's costing me less than a dollar a month. Yeah, <laughs> and you got it forever. I mean, I got unless, it forever. You know, it, yeah, one thing in my gym that uh, I showed to Richard Soren, he, it's a 150 pound globe dumbbell, but there's no brand on it. And you mentioned that like you had come across some old wide flang plates that didn't have yeah. the York on it. So I almost, I wonder if like this dumbbell I have was a York dumbbell that may have made its way to like those circus days when they would hold circus strongman or um, what was in uh, like Staten, not Staten Island, um, Coney, Island. Coney Island. It's a 150 pound globe, but doesn't have a brand on it. I'm guessing, well, remember they had like, like uh, the Travis Bell out here. Yep. There's no brand on it, but we know it was Travis Bells and the good, the good brothers had something similar. To Where were the Travis Bells from? New York, they, they, they he had, a, he had the bucks to have it like personalized, customized. Gotcha. And some of these guys did, could have been a professional strongman had that dumbbell because right. one of the things that they did was a bent press in those days. Yes. And that was you had, you had to have some skill at that, but but still, I mean, a guy who had some some size and some background of bent pressing could, could do the 150. Pounds. That was yeah. There haven't been too many. I think there's been two or three guys since I've had it since 2007 that have gotten it over their head. Well, if you can do it, that's pretty good. If I don't you care do how it, you do I'm it. Messing with you. Yeah, that's pretty darn good. So when you were working on the magazines, Jan, yeah. you know, how, what did you know about the, you know, I didn't realize how, you know, when we're uh, done doing the interview, we're going to get like some video footage, but this, this is a huge company. There's a lot going on here with equipment. Mm -hmm. So were you ever seeing them making the plates? I even know Dr. Ken had Iron Island plates made, plates. which I've got a pair. Yeah. Um, uh, he called me up and said, I'd like, when he, he hadn't had a, bought Iron Island gym for too long, or hadn't had it for too long. <clears throat> he said, what about these custom plate things? I'd like to get some Iron Island plates. And so we discussed the logo and how he wanted them. It that was fine. Like and then he said, I said, what color do you want them? Crocus. I thought he was kidding me. It's like a purple. Yeah. yeah. Why? What was his? I, I don't know if Kathy. All right. I can't probably tell you one of the things. He said a bunch of things. But uh, anyway, he, he said, uh, I think Kathy liked them. Or he said that crocus is our color. Oh, yeah. so, so I'm going to have to get out the color wheel here, but any, <laughs> anyway, so I did, and, and we we got plates that says, and there was a minimum, I mean, you had to buy. He, I think it was like 220 pairs he got, something like that, I, I if I read you, correct. I think you had to buy at least 100, 145 pound custom plates. Had to make it worthwhile, right. because we had to do the uh, pattern for it. Who first. else did you do custom plates oh, for? Oh, a number of schools, uh, like uh, the Naval uh, Academy. Of course. Uh, Let's see, we did have University of Hawaii. You know, that's the Rainbow Warriors. How, well, what the shipping of that must have been tremendous. 
the, the interesting thing about the pattern is they have the, those rainbows. Yes. And there's what, five, six colors? Right. So you have to be very intricately, they can't all be on the same level, those colors. Very minutely, just the, the first one, down just millimeter, and, and then do another stripe, and then do five or six of Amazing. those. Amazing. So the and, university and, had the money for that. Yeah, and, and then, then, like you said, ship it to Hawaii. Wow. When was that? Because I know... Um, I think it was the 1980s. 1980s? Was Bill Starr a strength coach there back then, do you know? No. no. Okay. Bill Starr was back in Baltimore at that point. At John's Hopkins. Well, he tried to transfer back and forth between Baltimore and uh, Texas. Okay. Yeah, he, he sort of... He'd go visit his friend Tom Suggs down there in Texas. Right, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, but he was also... I know he was a strength coach at uh, John Hopkins about 2000. Okay. And I forget when he got the job. I don't know, sometime in the late 1980s, I think. Okay. Um, Which was still fairly new. <clears throat> you know, that was a new profession, being a strength coach. I think roundabout when you started working at York, was Johnny Parker even a strength coach for in the 70s? Yeah, it was, was like mid-70s. Mississippi. Okay. Somewhere down there. And he was developing... Uh, a few I'll call them disciples, guys like Al Miller, you sure. wanted to do this, uh, and, and nice guys. Yep. And they sort of found their way through this, first right. at colleges and then at the pros. Now, Johnny was lucky. He got attached to hip to Bill Parcells, oh. and he got hired at the Giants. When Parcells went to New England, he went with them. Uh, Parcells went somewhere else, he went with them. Um, the, Johnny's limitation was his wife was a professional educator and I mean like a college dean or something like okay. that so she had to get he had to match her work with his and things yeah. like that uh, but yeah Johnny uh, did pretty well for himself we yeah. I had a couple of conversations with Johnny over the years uh, Dick Smith who uh, was was our resident coach and also a salesperson here and a general jack of all trades we got a real good rapport with Johnny Parker in fact Johnny Parker um, and a few other guys, Al Vermeil, a few other guys, uh, yeah, like called, uh, would call Dick up frequently. To talk about training? Yes. Well, see, Dick, where, where would, so, uh, Dick, Dick would have a lot of contact with the Soviet athletes with like the big weightlifters. There are some articles in the, that we featured during one of our episodes in I think strength and health, maybe it was MD, but it was like about how the Soviets were training. Yeah, that was always the big news. It was the 60s, maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah. We were starting to get some of their, they, they were coming and getting really like, just be the team to be. Yes. And they started out with uh, some of their ex-lifters. Medvedev uh, had some periodization literature out there. Which still gets quoted. They had special exercise. They were showing like the good morning with... Um, yeah, yeah, it was... was I wonder if that's where Grimmick started picking up on his good morning because they showed photos of their good mornings with their legs totally locked out. Some of our Europeans <coughs> did this uh, in general. They liked the good mornings a lot. Bill Starr liked the good mornings. I think he f picked it up from them. Uh, you found some of the uh, European lifters liked it with straight legs, some of them liked it with bent legs. Power lifters do it, it's almost another squat. Uh, but but it, it's, it's a very uh, common exercise. Right. And uh, yeah, that was the big secret because, well, let's face it, in the 40s and into the early 50s, it was USA lifters. Yep. They were. It was the Egyptians for a while in the 40s, then it was us for maybe about 10 years. Then the Soviets started coming on beating. So we were, you know, Huffman, he wanted to, we have to raise young men to beat them and you know, so on and so forth. So th that was the big curiosity. What was he very inspired to like make America strong? Was that a big... Well, that was, that was one of these things. It was, a good, it was a good for business, first good of all. Did he ever hold like uh, company meetings and say, this is where we got to focus our writing on? Not my time. Okay. Not my time. He's pretty much led from the pages of Strength and Health magazine in that regard. Because I think even in the 60s, he was still writing a lot of his own World Weightlifting Championship reports and things like that. I'm sure they got edited, but he was writing, you know, he had the commentary and the tidbits and uh, was still plugged into it. I, by the 70s, late 60s, 70s, he was starting to drift. Thank you for supporting the Iron Roots podcast brought to you by Play. 
To see this episode and all the other educational resources brought to you by Play, go to play.pro, P-L-A-E dot pro. You're going to love it, and we'll see you next time.